So um, first, uh, I will gonna I'm gonna talk uh, about the relevance of studying greenhouse gas emissions in agriculture. Uh, then how we measure these greenhouse gases. I will uh, present some of my current research projects and then some of my future uh, plans. So we start um, with a very general uh, topic on why is it important to, to, uh, to study greenhouse gases. Uh, and, and this is because the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere has been increasing. Uh, these are uh, some figures from the inter uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And on the left side, on the upper part, we can see the CO2 concentration from the uh, year uh, zero until uh, present time. And we see that both uh, for all gases, so CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide, the concentration was very, very stable for um, for yeah, 19 centuries, basically. And then in the 19th century, the concentration started to increase uh, very fast. And um, these data come from, from ice cores. So uh, we did not have uh, measurements, of course, and this is uh, back calculated from, from the ice cores and we can uh, clearly see these increases. But if we look at the right side um, and we look at data from the 60s or 1960s until now, that there were already some stations in some parts of the world and then um, uh, they are the number of stations that measure atmospheric concentrations is increasing. Uh, and now uh, we can measure CO2, methane and nitrous oxide in in many parts of the world, we see that, that there is indeed an increase on, on concentration, and we are also reporting this increase in concentration. If you look at the upper figure with the CO2, you can see that there is a little dent, uh, that the, the concentration doesn't go up uh, directly, but there's like a little uh, pattern, and this is uh, related to the um, CO2 absorption uh, by the by the ecosystems during the spring and, and summertime, mostly in the northern hemisphere, because uh, yeah, the amount of, of land is, is larger. So what we can see here is um, the increase uh, of, of greenhouse gases on a yearly basis and, and related to, to 1750. So uh, this is data for, for 2021, but um, the, it's uh, related to se uh, 1750 is 150% increase on the CO2 concentration, 262% on methane and, and 125 nearly for nitrous oxide. So this means that on an on a yearly basis, there's an increase of 2.4 ppm per year of CO2, 9.2 ppb, so par parts per billion. So the concentration of methane and N2O in the atmosphere is much lower, but still they are increasing uh, on a yearly basis. And then that said, these are the gases. Uh, or the most relevant anthropogenic gases um, that are uh, causing climate change. But why do we talk about this uh, here in, in Fenorob or in, in, uh, in, a, in a platform where we are discussing agriculture and at the agricultural faculty? And this is because uh, agriculture does have a very relevant, uh, does play a very relevant role um, in the production of greenhouse gases production and, and consumption. We will see that um, at the global uh, level, it's about 10% in Europe, it's about 12% of the emissions in Europe. And in Germany, uh, agriculture is responsible for about 7,5% of the agriculture of the global emissions. So here in this graph, we can see all the, all the different sectors that are accounted when we uh, calculate the, the global greenhouse budgets or the greenhouse budgets for, for Europe. And um, the lower part here in green is the agriculture, forestry, and fishing sector. It's all mixed here. Um, but what I wanted to show here is that this is quite a relevant constant, a uh, relevant uh, proportion in the, um, a year to year, so it doesn't change so much. If you look at the second quartal of 2020, we see that the emissions were much lower. So this was the lockdown during COVID, um, the hard lockdown, and, and in Europe, this resulted in, in lower emissions, certainly mostly from transportation and, and industry, uh, but the agricultural emissions do not change very much. Uh, so this is something that uh, needs to be targeted and, and that there is an opportunity to to yeah, intervene with that. So 
Um, here we see this is a, just from the agricultural uh, emissions. So in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, agriculture is grouped together with forestry and land use uh, change as a whole. And, and in this upper figure, I wanted to show that the relevance of the um, three greenhouse gases or, or each of these gases in each of the activities. And this is at global level. And you see that the largest part is uh, in green, the CO2 and it says Lulu CA. So this is land use, land use change and forestry. And this has the largest uh, proportion. And if you go to the lower figure, you see that this green part is very relevant in, in Africa or in, in Latin America. Um, uh, and uh, and Southeast Asia, this is due to deforestation. So uh, in Europe, and this is the, the figure that I've highlighted on the right side, uh, this is uh, much smaller because, uh, yeah, there's some land use change, but deforestation is uh, not happening anymore. Uh, so, but there's um, other sectors that are, are relevant. And uh, we are going to see that, for example, in pink is rice cultivation, which is a very relevant source of methane emissions. The yellow is synthetic uh, fertilizer application, which uh, leads to nitrous oxide emissions. And nitrous oxide is a very strong greenhouse gas, so that's also quite relevant. The orange is the enteric fermentation, so uh, coming from cattle, and this also plays a relevant role in Europe. But I will not go too much in detail uh, to this part. So now um, we are going to talk only about croplands, and these are sources and sinks of the of the three most relevant uh, greenhouse gases. And um, and this is why we have to, to study the ecosystem as a whole. Uh, so the CO2 is part uh, of a, the carbon cycle, basically. And there is a capture of CO2 from the ecosystem. So uh, taking CO2 from the atmosphere and putting it into the crop and into the soil through photosynthesis, and there is release of CO2 to the atmosphere, mostly through respiration uh, of plants and, and soil respiration. Uh, regarding nitrous oxide, as I say, croplands is one, or uh, yeah, croplands are one of the most relevant sources. The emissions are produced through several processes like nitrification, denitrification, etc. And there's also the potential for uh, some meth uh, nitrous oxide consumption. This is um, a, a small uh, uh, capacity. And then methane in upland soils like uh, cropland, that, like we see here. Uh, uh, like uh, with cereals uh, generally, or well, dry cereals, this is usually very, very small. Sometimes you can see a bit of uh, methane uptake, but uh, when we go to rice paddy fields, they become very, very large methane emissions. So this they, this, they play a very relevant role. And something very important is that um, agricultural soils have a large capacity for storing carbon. And then this is, uh, we have to try to uh, search for management practices that increase the carbon storage capacity in the soil, um, but that we do not, these increases in carbon do not lead to increased uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So there's some chances of trade-offs between different management practices, and we will look at that in detail later. But we've seen these greenhouse gases uh, and that they are producing croplands. But if we would want to, um, to measure them, how uh, there's different techniques. And I'm going to present the two more common techniques. And these are the techniques that I am I'm using. So um, on the left side, uh, you see these uh, buckets, looking like buckets, white things. These are chambers. So chambers are placed in the soil and they close um, the headspace of soil and crop. And then we see the, the, we measure the concentration of the gases inside. And these uh, have the capacity, the advantage that they are easy to manipulate, much uh, lower cost. Uh, but of course, you only cover a very small surface and you are interfering a lot with the ecosystem while you use them. Another alternative is the use of eddy covariance. Uh, so it flux towers. These are towers that are built on the ecosystem and based on the eddy covariance technique, you can estimate the greenhouse gas fluxes from a larger um, area from the whole ecosystem. So I'm going to briefly explain uh, uh, both techniques with the yeah, advantages and disadvantages of both, uh, uh, because these are the techniques that I, I'm mostly using in my research. 
So for chamber measurements, as I said, um, this is a way of closing um, uh, the atmosphere, including or not including the crop. This depends on, on the type of ecosystem. When the plants are very high, this is um, uh, very complicated, like rapeseed or mice, for example. Um, and then uh, the material which uh, that is used is usually very simple, plastic PVC. Um, and then you close it for a certain period of time. So the pictures I'm showing here, these are uh, chambers that are done uh, manually and you close them for, uh, this was about uh, 30 minutes. And then uh, using syringes and uh, you extract gas from inside the chamber. And then we measure the concentration um, at just at closure, and then 10 minutes later, 20 minutes later, 30 minutes later, and we see the increase of concentration with time. And then the slope of the increase in of concentration in relation to the volume and the surface of the chamber gives the flux. So this is quite simple. Once you have a gas chromatograph, this is a simple method. This is for CO2, but it's usually done for nitrous oxide um, or, or methane. Uh, but the problem is that it's very manual. You need to take a, a lot of uh, samples and then the spatial coverage is usually, uh, or the temporal coverage and spatial coverage are usually not very good. Um, thanks to the development of newer analyzers, which are now uh, faster and portable, this is a nitrous oxide analyzer that we are using in the field, uh, can be connected to one of these chambers, and this is one uh, we are using at the moment, and then inside the chamber we just uh, put a fan to, to uh, mix the air inside, and there is uh, an outflow from the chamber that would go to the analyzer and an inflow, and then uh, the, the concentration inside the chamber is continuously monitored, and in the right figure, this is for nitrous oxide, we can see how when we close the chamber, the concentration inside the chamber starts increasing, and this is a, a very linear increase. This is an example after fertilization that fluxes look uh, fantastic. Uh, then we open the chamber again, the concentration goes down again, we close the chamber again and in the next treatment or next uh, plot. And each of uh, these increases are from, from one of our chambers. So this allows to get the data real time, which is much nicer when you want to decide um, if there's a lot going on in the field and you want to um, measure and or in a laboratory incubation, etc. So it, it gives um, uh, the data much faster than the gas chromatography and much more information than was possible to do with, with um, gas chromatography. And then the eddy covariance. So the chambers, as we say, they are not very not so expensive, except for if we take these fast analyzers that are becoming uh, a bit more expensive. Uh, but they cover a small surface. This um, uh, has the advantage that you can deploy them in different treatments. Uh, but still, you are only measuring um, smaller surfaces when that, uh, considering the soil is very variable, uh, do not capture the spatial variability of, of the ecosystem. Uh, so the eddy covariance technique is a less intrusive method once you've installed it, and it consists on a tower that you installed above the ecosystem, and this is an example for a, a forest uh, or an ecosystem with trees, but it would work exactly the same uh, in a cropland. So the tower has to go above the canopy at a certain distance on top of the canopy, and on top of the tower we install uh, certain instruments. And in the end, this works as, as an imaginary chamber, as we would have this chamber that is closed uh, on the ecosystem system. Uh, and we are assuming that the flux that goes into the chamber, uh, the, so the, the air that goes into this imaginary chamber and that goes out um, is supposed to has a con constant concentration of gases and whatever changes that are, they are produced are because of the fluxes that are happening in this imaginary chamber. So here we can think on the upper uh, figure on the left that there is three molecules from the from the air that goes into the chamber, we go into our uh, area of study, and if there's no flux, there keeps on being three imaginary uh, three molecules of whatever gas we are studying, and then the uh, air forms a turbulence, which are called eddies, and this is why the technique is called eddy covariance. And this turbulence moves the molecules up and down. And if there would be no flux, the number of molecules that we would measure up and down would be exactly the same. 
However, if there would be uh, some fluxes going into the uh, into the um, uh, in, during the our area of interest, then we would have some more molecules. We would have five hypothetically, and then we would measure more molecules on the way up than on the on the way down. So we would have a positive flux. So how is this done? This is we put the tower on top of the ecosystem. We install a sonic anemometer that measures the wind, uh, all the three components of the wind at uh, very fast, twenty hertz, so twenty times per second. And we also measure the concentration of the gas of interest. This instrument that I'm uh, indicating here is for CO two and water, but we could use other instruments for other gases when they are available because not everything is available in the market. Um, and then we will calculate the covariance between the vertical wind speed and the and the concentration of the gas we are we are studying. So if we would have in the upper figure, we see that the um, the wind and this concentration um, go in the same direction are positively correlated. Then there is um, a positive flux, which means release from the ecosystem to the atmosphere. While when the in the lower figure, the wind and the concentration of the gas are uh, negatively correlated, and then this would indicate uptake from the atmosphere to the ecosystem. So this is some example of some of the towers I've been working with, um, and I'm gonna try to present you some results. So this is measurements of CO2 at the ecosystem level from a rice paddy field, and please only look at the dark, uh, the black points. So this is two years of measurement in a rice paddy field, and if you see that in, from January to April, uh, fluxes are close to zero most of the time, and then um, the ecosystem starts taking up a lot of carbon from the atmosphere. This is because the rice starts growing and there is a peak um, in July and then the, the ecosystem starts drying up the rice, starts, uh, they remove the water, the dry, um, the rice starts drying and then the capture decreases, decreases until harvest that then is close to, close to zero. And then this is the same um, uh, on the second year. Uh, in this particular experiment, we measure both with eddy covariance and with chambers, as you can see in this um, in this figure, uh, for methane fluxes. And the advantage is, if you see the black points are the chambers, and this is very quite a lot of data, but still only every now and then. While the eddy covariance gives data uh, every thirty minutes, uh, and the chambers give you data whenever you go once every day. So these are manual chambers. And here we had a mid-season drainage of the water table on the second year, which resulted on, on lower uh, greenhouse gas uh, methane emissions. Of course, this uh, might have effects on the yield, and it did, uh, so this also has to be accounted for. So now I'm going to try to explain uh, my current research project. So this was general about the relevance of greenhouse gases and the te techniques we are using. And um, I'm currently working uh, on, on two projects, uh, or we have two running projects, uh, which are still at the University of Göttingen because they are happening in the field and we cannot uh, yeah, move them. Um, so the first one, we are measuring um, nitrous oxide fluxes with eddy covariance um, in, a, in, a, in a new tower that we established. Uh, this is a crop rotation with sugar beet. I think we're starting with wheat uh, now. And um, we measured uh, uh, for about a year already. And uh, what we see is that the, we get a lot of information, a lot of points. Each blue point is um, it's a measurement. We applied fertilization and we didn't get higher fluxes after fertilization, but uh, only um, the, the emissions increased in June. Uh, once the, uh, temper the temperatures were higher and the soil moisture was was high enough, but um, if uh, we look at if you look at the lower figure now, uh, this is in parallel measurements of the eddy covariance and uh, chamber techniques, and um, this is our, around the flux tower we measured also with chambers and we had eight chambers and we do see a small increase or some increase of of the fluxes after fertilization but very small that we were not able to capture with the eddy covariance. So the problem of the eddy covariance for this. Uh, gases that are very slow, uh, but that have very small concentrations and that the fluxes are very small, is that they are very challenging. So they work very, very well. Eddy covariance works very, very well for CO2 or for methane, for example, in a rice paddy field. But in croplands, this is very challenging. So there is a lot of development that still needs to be done. 
And we want to continue working on, on that. And as you see on the lower figure with the chambers, we measure eight points around the flux tower, and there is a lot of variability between each of these points. So each point is um, it's a chamber at each sampling date. So then we decided to also do um, as a campaign uh, to understand the spatial variability of the fluxes. And here we did 100 points in the same day around the flux tower. And you see the large spatial variability that, that the fluxes have. So the point in the center uh, with uh, little lines are, are is the flux tower. And each square is a point where we measure uh, the fluxes with the chamber, with this uh, portable chamber, uh, with a um, fast N2O analyzer. And yeah, we saw this large uh, spatial variability. And this project is not only about the fluxes. So what I've explained that we are doing at the moment is just the work package one, so edit covariance and chambers. But we're also looking at all the drivers with all the meteorological conditions, radiation, temperature, et cetera. But also what is very relevant for us are how the man management practices and crop ecology affect uh, the emissions and what are the drivers for these emissions in terms of nitrogen availability in the soil, the soil for organic carbon, carbon temperature or, or moisture. And we have a special work package on mechanisms where we are looking at the isotopic signal um, of the nitrous oxide, the natural abundance of, of the 15N and 16O molecule in the, in the nitrous oxide, and about the genes that are responsible for the microbial communities that are producing nitrogen uh, or nitrous oxide in the soil. So this is still work in progress and that will continue in the next years. And then another project that I wanted to share with you is the True Soil project. So this is a large um, a research initiative on a consortium. We are 13 partners from, from all continents, most, uh, basically. Um, this is a part of the European Joint Program on Soils. And um, uh, I, so we are all of us, as a, we are all together trying to understand trade-offs between soil organic carbon sequestration. So management practices that increase soil organic carbon in the soil in agricultural fields and uh, greenhouse gas emissions, particularly nitrous oxide. And I cannot go in detail to all the activities, but I'm going to present some of what we do in, in the German soup project. And we have a trial with conventional and reduced tillage that has been running since the 70s and where there is already higher carbon in the upper, in the topsoil, thanks to this reduced tillage. Uh, so we started measuring CO2 and nitrous oxide and we installed rain out shelters that you can see um, on the lower figure to intercept 50% of the rainfall. We've measured uh, very often, uh, quite regularly, uh, the arrows indicate fertilization events or harvest uh, or, or tillage. And we see how the, all the management practices have an effect on the emissions. Upper part is uh, soil, respira soil respiration and, and the lower part is nitrous oxide fluxes. But when you look at the lower right figure, you see that um, on the reduced tillage, there is usually there's a higher nitrous oxide emission. So there is indeed a, a trade-off that we are accumulating carbon in the topsoil, but the nitrous oxide emissions are, are higher. So this needs to be taken into account when decided, uh, deciding which management practices we, we suggest. And as we are doing this in many countries, so the rainout shelters are, are being installed in at least six countries. These are data from four of them uh, with different management practices aiming at carbon sequestration, so cover crops or additional or straw or how the slope uh, where the rain, uh, the erosion accumulates more or less carbon, and then uh, try to see the effect of on nitrous oxide emissions and on greenhouse gas. And also uh, we'll see here that German fluxes are much higher, but this is because we've measured for longer time. So this still needs, needs to be compiled for, for everybody. Okay, and now I'm just coming to an end and I want to um, talk of, of what I'm doing, but I wanna have uh, present a little bit what are my research plans uh, here in Bonn and in Fenorop. So um, I would like, I want to build a flux tower and we are, this is planned in the campus Klein Altendorf. So thanks uh, to people who work there and have been helping me to find a, a, a plot that is large enough. So this is about 10 hectares um, where uh, we will install a flux tower 
And we've been doing some analysis uh, of the predominant wind directions and the speed, and we see that the wind comes mostly from the southwest. So that this place, if we put the tower, uh, we should have, yeah, the footprint should be good, good enough so that this place is good enough for our installation. So the idea here um, is to have a, a flex tower. Uh, this is an example on how they uh, usually are and the standard analyzers for CO2, water, et cetera, but, um, and all the meteorological measurements, so radiation, uh, rain, temperature, wind, uh, et cetera. But in red, I've highlighted two things that are very new. So, well, the nitrous oxide that we are also doing in Göttingen, and I say this is new, this is happening in some places, but it's still very, very challenging uh, in many ecosystems because of the very low fluxes. So this is something we want to continue working on. And then something very new is the opportunity to measure ammonia emissions. There is a very new analyzer that has been tested that seems to be working fine, at least for very short periods of time. Let's see how we how this goes. So my idea is to start building a tower that we can where we can look at the full nitrogen losses from the ecosystem. So this is the idea. And then I've included here some chambers because I think the combination of both both techniques gives the best of both methods basically and can help overcome the problems of each of them so and would help us measuring for example methane emissions that i'm sure they are very very low but uh, maybe there's some consumption and we are not going to see that in any covariance uh, but maybe with chambers so this can help us uh, understanding some of these other fluxes and of course, we are planning one tower for the moment, uh, but the idea would be to have pair towers so that we can compare different management practices or treatments, how they affect uh, uh, greenhouse gases, so that we are not looking only at the quantification of the ecosystem and the, um, and the yeah and, and how the emissions are working in a certain ecosystem, but how managing this ecosystem can affect the emissions. So, so um, yeah, so this is from the flag tower point of view. And then... I would like to uh, use the opportunity of FENOROP, where there is a lot of robots uh, doing different activities to also build some type of robots. This is a, a prototype or well, not a prototype, this is working in, in Norway from some of the colleagues from the, our Trusol project and that we could have some similar setups that would allow us to measure automatically with one of these analyzers installed in the robot and that we would have closed chamber, uh, chambers that would be closed in different treatments. So we would have uh, the advantage of the treat of the chambers that we can do a lot of treatments, but without having the disadvantage of not having enough measurements because we cannot go to the field continuously. So this would overcome some of the problems with the chambers. So this is it from my side. Thanks a lot for your attention. I would like to also uh, use the opportunity to thank all the team who has remained in Göttingen to keep all these trials running for the next two years until things are set. Um, and uh, yeah, if you have any questions, of course, you can let me know. I'm open uh, for discussions now and also by email. Thanks for your attention.